The subcommittee will come to order. The chair recognizes herself for an opening statement. Today we are, make, we are taking an important first step toward making the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, or SIPSIA, the kind of truly landmark legislation it was originally intended to be. When SIPSIA was signed into law in 2008, it modernized and strengthened the Consumer Product Safety Commission in many different and meaningful ways. It was also the first significant reform of the CPSC in nearly two decades. While SIPSIA has many virtues, there are some unintended consequences of the law as well. Over the past four months, we have carefully reviewed the provisions with, which have turned out to be overreaching, and today we are offering legislation to fix them. Admittedly, this is a careful balancing act, but even the uh, CPSC has recognized the problems with SIPSIA and has re requested greater flexibility in implementing the new law. For thousands of businesses which strive to be responsible, let's do what best for, cons for consumers. SIPSIA has consumed an inordinate, an inordinate uh, amount of uh, their time trying to understand how each new regulation and standard will affect them. Unfortunately, many have gone out of business, attributing their demise to some of the burdens of compliance. Today, we are attempting to strike a careful balance. As a nation, we simply cannot afford to lose jobs or stifle innovation because of questionable regulations. Frankly, many businesses have never even heard of SIPSIA until well after it was enacted. Most were shocked to learn of the onerous requirements it would impose on them if they manufactured or sold any children's product, even though they had never done anything wrong and never had a single product recall. It all began with the best of intentions. In 2007, the widely publicized toy recalls for violations of the existing lead paint standard gave way to a new prohibition on lead content in children's products. As interpreted by the Commission, this category goes far beyond just toys to covering sporting goods, library books, ATVs, educational products, CDs, clothing, as well as many other items. The goal was a noble one, making products safer for our kids. But within just months of passage, both the Commission and Congress realized that problems with the new law would need to be addressed. Earlier this year, the Commission announced yet another stay of enforcement to avert potentially disastrous results for many American businesses. Today, the Commission has jurisdiction over literally thousands of different types of products. It's critically important that they should be able to prioritize their resources to address the products that pose the greatest risk to consumers. As I've said many times, as a mother, I have very strong, passionate feelings about protecting all children. But also, as a former small business owner, I know all too well how unnecessary regulations, even well-intentioned well ones, can destroy lives too. Today, we have a chance to fulfill SIPSIA's potential by working together to make a good law even better. Since becoming chairman, we have held two hearings on the issue. We've met with all of the key stakeholders, including consumer groups. I've also tried very hard to make this a bipartisan process by soliciting input from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, including Mr. Waxman, Mr. Dingle, Mr. Butterfield, and Ms. Schakowsky. While I understand that we still have differences of opinion, I hope that we can continue to work together to improve SIPSIA in ways that benefit all Americans and not just some of that. Now I recognize my friend from Mr. North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for his opening statement. Let me thank you, Chairman Bono Mack, uh, for recognizing me and thank you for, for calling this hearing today. Uh, let me just say for the record that uh, the Health Subcommittee, I believe, is convening at 10 o'clock this morning and we have some members of this subcommittee who also serve on that subcommittee. And so I've spoken to the chairman about it, and, and she can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we have an agreement uh, that we're going to do the opening statements now and reconvene after the subcommittee on health uh, completes its work, and then we will call up the bill and, and mark it up uh, later today. Uh, Madam Chairman, I wish I could say this morning that I support the draft bill that we are marking up. Unfortunately, years of partisan bickering about ways to improve the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act have taken us full circle, and we are right back to where we have started. Uh, I understand there are occasionally unintended burdens in some bills that become law, like some of the issues with sepsia. Uh, when Mr. Waxman was chairman of the full committee, he developed a fixed bill uh, that offered targeted relief for certain types of products uh, that was called the Consumer Product Safety Enhancement Act. It was supported by the National Association of Manufacturers, the Retail in Industry Leaders Association, the Motorcycle Industry Council, the Handmade Toy Alliance, and Goodwill Industries. Even consumer groups agreed not to oppose it. We had a consensus, but my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have refused to support that bill. 
So here we are today marking up the Enhancing CPSC Authority and Discretion Act of 2011. After our meeting that followed last month's hearing on this issue, I was hopeful that uh, the chairman, that, that, that we could work together to arrive at a compromise that provided targeted relief for industry while keeping our children safe. I'm disappointed uh, that Democratic staff was only able to continue to air our concerns with this bill. At no point was our Democratic staff shown or consulted about language to revise the bill or even told if or when changes would be made. Not surprisingly, when we got on, what we got on Tuesday night was a revised draft that looks remarkably like the problematic first draft. This draft bill does not preserve protections for children from potential harms. Children in some daycare centers shouldn't be placed in cribs that don't meet up-to-date and rigorous safety standards. A lead content limit should not be stretched to the to the benefit to benefit industry and to the detriment of our children when only a very narrow universe of products can't seem to meet the limits and mandatory third-party testing for a large number of children's products made by even the largest of manufacturers shouldn't be eliminated to alleviate the difficulties faced by our smallest businesses a toy box uh, shouldn't be a game of roulette uh, the risk to the safety and well-being of our children are just too great uh, Madam Chairman, I agree that there are issues with the law. Uh, we disagree, however, on how to best address those issues. I hope you will work uh, with me and with our staffs uh, in the coming weeks to arrive at a compromise uh, prior to the full committee markup that provides targeted relief to industry while maintaining the common sense safeguards afforded by SEPSIA. I want to thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. Gentleman yields back. Pursuant to the committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Are there further opening statements? Mr. Barton is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairwoman, I don't think I'll take five minutes. Um, I do want to compliment you for the discussion draft that you, that you circulated, and I also want to compliment you for the uh, changes that you've made in that um, discussion draft. I want to applaud you for bringing the bill before the subcommittee. Uh, we need to make some uh, common sense, sensible changes to the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, and I think the bill that we're going to begin to <coughs> mark up today uh, does that. It better defines the role of the agency that's been charged with overseeing the implementation of SIPSIA. Um, it also outlines the original intent of the underlying bill, and I believe um, accomplishes the task that we set out to when we passed that bill several years ago. Um, there are some that um, are saying that we are fast-tracking this process. I would point out that uh, we have actually slowed it down and delayed it uh, to give the stakeholders and members interested an opportunity to comment on the original discussion draft. Uh, as you know, you were at one time asked by full committee chairman Upton uh, to have done this markup uh, I think three weeks ago two or three weeks ago so uh, we are trying to work with our friends on the um, on the minority side to, to get a consensus agreement uh, this is a journey that uh, began back in 2007 when uh, the chairman Dingle was the chairman of the full committee it's a journey that uh, uh, continued in the last Congress under Chairman Waxman as the original bill was attempting to be implemented. We know we saw that uh, uh, there were uh, kind of a law of unintended consequences that came into being, and we were in the process of creating a regulatory and a uh, compliance nightmare. Um, we tried to amend the bill, the law, last Congress without any success, and under your leadership. Um, Chairwoman, I'm sure that we're going to actually be able to to, uh, to make some common sense changes and implement the law in this Congress. Uh, some of the substantive changes that are included in this uh, in this bill that we're going to mark up uh, include points that former Chairman Waxman uh, has been advocating for, specifically provisions relating to the application of lead limits in used products, the prospective application of a .01 lead limit an exception for small batch manufacturers, an automatic revision of the standard for durable nursery products, removal of double enforcement concerns between the CPSC and the FDA, the limitation to accessible parts as it relates to phthalates and other provisions, 
uh, relating to the CPSC subpoena authority or all changes that have been made to the original discussion draft that Mr. Waxman has been advocating for. It is my hope that over the course of this markup, uh, we'll have a uh, constructive discussion of the bill, uh, and if amendments are offered, I hope that uh, we can address those in a bipartisan fashion. I do believe that we need to protect our children, and I do believe that uh, uh, the law, if we can perfect it, uh, will do that. So, Madam Chairwoman, I uh, commend you for, for your leadership, and I look forward to working with you and Mr. Butterfield and and Ms. Schakowsky, Mr. Waxman, and others as we move the bill forward. And finally, uh, uh, this is my little mascot. This, this is something that came from uh, uh, the, my de a debate that I had uh, with uh, Senator Boxer on the conference committee several years ago uh, when we were discussing the issue of phthalates. And uh, my recollection is that uh, uh, a child would have to eat 7,000 of these uh, in order to get a, um, uh, a, a toxicity level in their bloodstream that could be harmful. So hopefully we can work to make sure that no child in America uh, ever uh, is exposed to the, uh, the predator rubber duck and the phthalates that are uh, in that ducking. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there further opening statements? Mr. Waxman is recognized for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Madam Chairwoman, as usual, um, Congressman Barton has given us something to chew on. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I agree with uh, our chair, Chairman Bono Mack. The changes are needed to the Children's Product Safety Bill we passed in 2008. That legislation was an historic step forward, but like most legislation, it was not perfect. It had some unintended consequences and needs refinement. After the subcommittee hearing last month, Ranking Member Butterfield and I asked to meet with Chairman Bono Mack. We said that we wanted to work with her and other members to find a bipartisan consensus. And we said that we believed it should be possible to address the concerns being raised by ATV manufacturers, bicycle manufacturers, makers of handcrafted toys, and other groups without fundamentally undermining the law. Since that meeting, our staffs have had several uh, additional uh, meetings. They have been constructive, but we did not get new language from the majority until late Tuesday. The new language makes many changes in the draft that our staffs never discussed. And while some of the changes are helpful, the draft bill still has fundamental flaws. The rationale for short-circuiting our discussions and proceeding to markup is the need to move quickly. But passing another partisan bill out of the committee and the House won't provide any relief to industry. A partisan bill that puts our children at risk has no prospect of passing the Senate or being signed by President Obama. There is only one quick path to a bill that can be signed into law, and that is for us to reach agreement. There are many problems with the bill before us today, and just listen to what the experts are saying. The Consumer Federation of America told us yesterday that it is profoundly disappointed because the legislation, quote, moves the pendulum backwards and removes existing protections, making our children vulnerable once again, end quote. Consumers Union said, this draft bill sets up impossible hurdles that would likely mean toys and other children's products wouldn't be adequately tested for safety, end quote. The American Academy of Pediatrics said it has profound concerns because the bill would allow more lead in toys and other products designed for children. Health experts say that products with 100 parts per million of lead can be dangerous to young children. This bill would allow children's lunch boxes, large toys, and many other children's products to have three times this level of lead. The bill would eviscerate the third-party testing requirements that give parents assurance that the toys they buy meet safety standards. And it would undermine the new consumer complaint database by letting manufacturers block the posting of any consumer complaint they allege is materially inaccurate. 
There is a consensus that ATV and bicycle makers should receive some relief from the 2008 law. But this bill says that all manufacturers of outdoor products can have lead levels up to 40,000 parts per million. That's 400 times more lead than the law allows. ATV and bicycle manufacturers are asking for targeted relief, not a huge and dangerous loophole like this. In fact, the All-Terrain Vehicle Association wrote us yesterday that it, quote, disapproves of the process in which this draft bill was scheduled for consideration, end quote. We need, need to move past the idea that compromise is a bad word. Legitimate concerns have been raised by manufacturers. If we work together, we can address those concerns without jeopardizing children's health, and we can produce a law that the president will sign. Um, I, I uh, want to make a, a strong suggestion. Uh, Chairman Bono Mack and uh, Chairman Emeritus and uh, Chairman Upton should not bring this legislation to the full committee until we've reached agreement or we've exhausted the possibility of reaching agreement. Uh, our committee needs accomplishments, not more partisan bills and unilateral action uh, by the majority. And we stand ready and anxious and willing to work with you. I thought this issue could have easily been resolved before today. I'm sorry it has not been, and I continue to hope that we will reach a consensus. Yield back my time. The gentleman yields back, and the chair recognizes Ms. Blackburn for her opening statement for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I want to thank the chairman and the committee for the thoughtful way that they have moved forward in this legislation and also uh, thank our staff for the amount of work that they have done. You know, when you look at the fact that we had a meeting in January, uh, we had an oversight hearing in February, we had a uh, hearing on the discussion draft in April, and here we are in May. I think that that is an efficient and appropriate way to move forward, and I thank you for the leadership that has been there. Uh, there are a few things that we want to uh, accomplish in this markup today. One is what we're hearing from our constituents. Reduce these regulatory burdens. Uh, they are, <clears throat> as my mother, <clears throat> pardon me, my mother would say they are ill and fatigued. Uh, industry has grown ill and fatigued with the overreach and the burdensome regulation that get heaps, gets heaped on them. We want to enhance the CPSC's ability to investigate complaints and to do it promptly and appropriately. And then the database issue, improve the utility and efficiency. And of course, I'm one of those that uh, think what, that we're not undermining the database, as my colleague um, thinks. I, I think that we would never allow industry to have a database that did not function and was putting out incomplete information, we would never allow that to take place. And the FTC needs to take this database down, in my opinion, until they get it right. I, I think that that is only the fair thing to do. A couple of things in the bill. Uh, the exceptions, uh, dealing with products that are sold through our charities, uh, through resale, I appreciate that we have that exception in there. And then with the third-party testing, um, that we have a small batch manufacturing exception in that I uh, am glad that those are included. And Madam Chairman, I look forward to continuing to work through and in the interest of time, I'm yielding back. Gentlelady yields back. The Chair recognizes Ms. Schakowsky for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Today we're considering making changes to the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, a bill that was passed in honor of the many children who have been injured or killed by dangerous products, including Danny Kayser. Uh, Danny was just 16 months old when he was strangled in a portable crib that collapsed. When Danny was killed, the crib, mo the crib model had been recalled for five years already and had caused the deaths of four other children. Danny died on May 12, 1998, exactly 13 years ago today. And here we are honoring his memory by considering legislation that would roll back the protections in landmark legislation that bears his name. 
Madam Chairwoman, I understand that the current draft of this legislation restores third-party testing for durable infant products, including cribs, so that we can prevent deaths like Danny. I appreciate your efforts to protect these provisions, which I authored and which were named in Danny's honor. Durable infant goods are the items that get used over a period of years, often for multiple children, and may get passed around among family, friends, and neighbors. Ensuring that such products are safe is absolutely critical. Parents should feel confident that the cribs, bassinets, and playpens they use, where young children sleep and are left alone for significant periods of time, are safe. However, while this bill protects third-party testing for those items, at the same time it dramatically undermines third-party testing for countless other children's products. This bill would place so many burdens on the CPSC that mandating third-party testing for lead, phthalates, and the toy safety standard would be nearly impossible. It would take us back to the situation we were in before we passed the CPSIA, uh, to the days when our children were the test subjects for safety. The CPSIA was drafted, negotiated, and passed with strong bipartisan support at every step of the process. We all acknowledge that there are some technical fixes, as uh, Mr. Waxman has, has outlined and has offered over the last couple years, um, and, uh, and that would allow the CPSC to better implement the, uh, the bill. This subcommittee should be able to come to an agreement on a bipartisan basis to make those fixes. Unfortunately, the bill before us today does not represent the type of collaboration and agreement, and I can't support it as written. I, I certainly remember the early negotiations with Mr. With Mr. Barton um, back and forth on uh, practically every paragraph. It was, a, it was a great effort working together. I think we can do that, again, to, uh, to improve this, this legislation. We're all in agreement that it could use um, improvement, but the, I think the manner in which uh, the, the committee has operated now does not lend itself to that kind of, of, of compromise. And finally, let me say, when we talk about constituents, I hope we're not just talking about industry. We are talking about the many consumers and children that are out there that need our advocacy. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Harper for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Bono Mack. Uh, first of all, I'd like to follow up on something that uh, uh, Mr. Waxman referred to about, I believe it was the American Motorcyclist Association that opposed it. We'll make it clear that the, the Motorcycle Industry Council, the manufacturers, strongly support this legislation, have worked with us. I don't believe the other reached out to us in time, and I wanted to make sure there was clarification on that, that we do have the full support of the manufacturers on this uh, for the ETV, or, or the ATVs, I mean. Uh, I believe the changes found in this legislation provide the Consumer Protection Safety Commission the direct uh, direction and flexibility it needs to assess risk and provide leadership on consumer product safety matters. During the 112th Congress, this subcommittee has held multiple hearings where we have heard from numerous affected parties, including the Consumer uh, Product Safety Commission, which has to administer and enforce these standards to businesses that must comply with the standards. While the effort to keep harmful products away from our kids and our households is of utmost importance, we have seen many unintended consequences from the Consumer Product Safety Improvements Act of 2008. These consequences have put a huge burden on businesses, large and small, and have taken toys and other products off the market that were intended for our youth. Specific instances include ATVs, off-road motorcycles, and other motorized rec uh, recreational vehicles designed primarily for children 12 and under. While the Commission acknowledged there was no measurable risk for lead absorption while operating this equipment, they were unable to grant an exclusion. The Commission has continually issued stays of enforcement, but still the result has seen a majority of ATV manufacturers no longer sell these youth models, while 90 percent of ATV-related deaths and injuries to children occur on larger, faster, adult-sized models. This has been a detriment to children's safety and a detriment to business. There are many other instances where Commission staff has reported that the economic costs associated with SIPSIA would be in the billions of dollars. I believe ICADA is a good step in the right direction to ensure compliance without saddling businesses with unwarranted burdens and cost. Another aspect of this legislation that I believe provides more guidance and flexibility is through changes to third-party testing requirements. While the Commission maintains the authority to require third-party testing, this legislation ensures that the benefits outweigh the risk. 
I am also in support of the changes this legislation, legislation makes to the public database requirements. The eligibility requirements ensure the individuals who suffered harm or risk of harm or individuals' permit, permission or are authorized will have the ability to submit these reports. Again, I'd like to thank the chairman for her, her leadership on this issue, and I look forward to our work to ensure consumer product safety is a priority. With that, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Mr. Olson for three minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership in bringing forward this legislation to fix and enhance consumer product safety. I'm pleased to be here this morning for this markup. This bill is long overdue and will correct many of the major flaws and unintended consequences of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, otherwise known as SIPSIA. As the father of two beautiful children, there's nothing that's more important to me than their health and their safety. However, the health and safety of our children does not have to come at the expense of small and family-owned businesses, which is effectively what the SIPSIA has done. We all agree that con the Consumer Product Safety Commission has an important job to do, but the unintended consequences of the SIPSIA law need to be reconsidered and fixed. By providing the Commission with the regulatory flexibility and enhancing their ability to investigate complaints more accurately, we can create needed reforms while still maintaining important consumer protections as originally intended under SIPSIA. Beyond this, we need to seek a common sense approach to ensure the safety of our children along with a robust future for our country's small businesses. Today, this committee is taking an important step forward in preserving American jobs while ensuring the safety and health of our children. Again, I thank the Chair for her leadership on this matter and look forward to supporting the reforms that this legislation makes. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The Chair recognizes Mr. McKinley for three minutes for his opening statement. No? Okay, I'll pass. And the Chair recognizes Mr. Pompeo for three minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I, think, I think you've done a great job in bringing this forward. I think we've um, had a, a wonderful process as we've, we've worked with uh, both sides to, to improve on this act. I, you know, I, I've been here four months, and the regulated community has just been clamoring uh, for changes to this act. Uh, we've had commissioners come talk to us about changes that needed to be made. Uh, but, you know, beyond those, as I look at this myself, uh, there's requirements there that, that no sane legislator would have possibly intended. I, I, hear the, I hear the folks on the other side talk about the fact that this was a bipartisan piece of legislation when it was passed, um, but I can promise you that the 112th Congress, the House of Representatives, doesn't think uh, that it makes sense uh, to do all of the things that are in there. I mean, it's just no common sense. It, that no, no sane legislator would, would knowingly forbid the sale of secondhand winter coats to needy children for fear that some stray zipper or button might conceivably contain some trivial amount of lead, uh, which poses no risk uh, to the wearer. But that's what this act does. No sane legislator would require third-party testing for lead of ordinary paper clips uh, because they happen to appear in a science kit tar targeted for elementary students. Yet that's what the act does. No sane legislator would outlaw the sale of child-sized brass instruments where there's no evidence that any child musician has ever been harmed. Uh, from holding a brass and therefore lead-laden horn. But that's what the act does. I hear story after story like this. Uh, in the first six weeks I was here, in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas, I had a group of good people, some good Samaritans from a local work working, woodworking guild. They had run a special project for years where they made uh, toys for kids at Christmas season. They made the toys by hand. Uh, they involved art students from Wichita State University and other local artists. They decorated the toys and distributed them through the Salvation Army to needy children who otherwise would not have toys. Sadly, as a direct result of this law, that program has been shut down. No one benefits when the nanny state works in this way. Uh, I, uh, I look forward to uh, working to make this bill better, and I appreciate all the work you've done on this, Madam Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any members? The chair recognizes Mr. Kinziger for three minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Talk about in the nick of time. That's how you do it, I guess. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, for your dedication to the issue and, and bringing forward the Enhancing CPSC Authority and Discretion Act to ensure the Consumer Protection Safety Commission 
is addressing the primary safety concern that led to, it, led to its creation in 2008. As a freshman member of Congress uh, and, and of this committee, I've heard directly from consumers and product manufacturers about the unintended consequences that will be imposed if Congress fails to act. I've been pleased with how this committee has worked to ensure the goals of the original legislation are maintained and that children's safety is protected. Time and time again, Congress reacts to current events with the best of intention, but often fails to ensure the good outweighs the bad. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was written with the best intentions to protect the health and welfare of children. Unfortunately, the overreaching lead requirements, misdirected public database, and unmanageable third-party testing is leading to unintended consequences that this committee resolves in this draft legislation. One unintended consequence of the 2008 Act prevented the manufacturing of child-sized ATVs. This resulted in children riding ATVs made for adults, creating a situation that is less safe for children. I'm pleased with the language in this legislation before the committee today that provides an exemption for recreational vehicles manufactured for use by children. I look forward to working closely with the committee to ensure this exemption is well-defined and straightforward in report language. This Congress is focused on ensuring that government is not restricting competitiveness and job growth by fostering a smarter and leaner bureaucracy. The Enhancing CPCS Authority and Discretion Act has been years in the making. It's legislation that has learned and improved from previous bipartisan attempts. I'm proud to support this bill and subcommittee and look forward to working with my colleagues to ensure floor action. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for the time, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The Chair thanks all members. We will now recess, subject to the call of the Chair. We will reconvene upon the conclusion of the health markup downstairs, and we will provide at least 15 minutes' notice. So the subcommittee stands recessed. An amendment 001 offered by Mrs. Bono Mack from California, an amendment Tech 01 offered by Mrs. Bono Mack of California. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and I recognize myself for five minutes in support of the amendment. Amendment uh, 001 corrects the drafting error in the base text that moves the effective date of the 0.03 percent step down from August 2009 to February 2009. Amending the date to August 14, 2009 preserves current law. Without the amendment, both the 0.06 percent and the 0.03 percent lead limits would be effective at the same time. The second amendment does a few things. First, it clarifies that mandatory third-party testing may only be required of lab if, uh, of, if lab capacity is sufficient or likely to be sufficient in a reasonable amount of time. Second, this amendment clarifies that persons permitted by the law to submit a report of harm on behalf of another person, for example, law enforcement officers, need only verify that they are authorized by law to submit the report. They do not need the permission of the person who was harmed. Third, now that we permit people other than the victim to submit reports of harm, the amendment addresses an omission in subsea by ensuring that the privacy of the person harmed is protected. Lastly, the amendment corrects a drafting error and redesignates the section uh, 14D as for section 14I. I urge members to support these amendments and I yield back my time. Is there a discussion on the amendment? For what purpose does the gentlewoman seek recognition? Uh, the uh, uh, re minority will uh, accept those amendments. All right. Is there any further discussion on our side on the amendments? All right. If there's no further discussion, and the chair is extremely happy about that, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor shall signify, I guess, by saying aye. The ayes have it. Um, thank you for agreeing. So the ayes have it. The, the amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? For what purpose does the gentlewoman seek recognition? Uh, Madam Chairman, I move to strike the last word. I have a couple of questions for counsel. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question. There's supposed to be a, a picture of a, uh, a plastic ball. Are we putting that up on the screen? Um, that, according to the manufacturer, is intended, if not there, picture a ball, okay, um, that, uh, according to the manufacturer, is intended for use by babies and toddlers. Under current law, this product cannot have more than 100 
parts per million, and that's appropriate because it is expected that a baby will um, repeatedly handle and mouth this toy. Although the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that toys such as this ball not contain more than 40 parts per million of lead, under the Republican discussion draft, this ball could have 300 parts per million, and according to some supporters the, of the provision, up to 349 parts per million. This is because under the Republican bill, the only products that have to meet the 100 parts per million standard are those that can, to quote the language of the draft legislation, quote, be sucked, or, uh, sucked and chewed, unquote. Objects like round balls that can only be licked that's also a quote, um, don't have to meet this standard. So, counsel, I wanted to confirm my reading of the bill. As I read the draft, this ball is round and too big to go inside a child's mouth, so it doesn't meet the draft's test for products that have to meet the 100 parts per million. Instead, under the Republican discussion draft, this ball could have, by my reading, 300 parts per million of lead. Is that correct? Unless the CPSC changes the results, which it is allowed to do, that would be correct. So that's one of my problems with this, uh, and I think it's a serious problem in the draft. There is no question that round objects like this plastic ball and other large objects don't meet the suck and chew standard. Under the bill we're considering, that means that they can have elevated levels of lead. To me, that's dangerous and doesn't make sense. So I have uh, another product question. Let me, oh, there's the ball up there. Now I'm going to move on to um, jewelry for, meant for 7 to 12-year-olds. See if we can get that. Um, called a, a mood necklace. I wanted to, to ask um, counsel about this necklace. The necklace is made for elementary school children, not children age 6 and under. But as we all know, younger children are attracted to jewelry worn by their older siblings. They often wear their older siblings' jewelry and sometimes put it in their mouth. Um, and actually, I, I certainly do see uh, older kids, too, just kind of sucking on things that are around their neck. But that's why high lead levels in a product like this would be especially a threat to young children. Uh, so my question is, counsel, under current law, this necklace will need to meet a lead standard of 100 parts per million starting in August. Is that correct? It depends on whether or not the CPSC finds that it's technologically feasible, potentially, but otherwise, yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, uh, under, under current law, would, but, uh, but un, that a different standard would apply now under the draft. My, my question is because... This product is intended for children that are older than six, so it would be subject to a more lenient 300 parts per million standard, right? That is correct unless the CPSC decides to um, bring it down to the lower standard or otherwise takes action on it, yes. Okay. Um, so this illustrates another problem with the, the bill. This particular necklace was actually recalled by the CPSC for high lead levels. Because of the risks to children, there is no reason this should have any lead at all. Yet this bill would triple the allowable lead uh, levels of lead in the in the necklace, and that's dangerous and doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, in addition, actually, to the, the the notes that were provided to me, I want to emphasize again that I have often seen children, including my own grandchildren, that are older than six years old, taking things that are hanging around their neck. And, uh, and putting them in their mouths. And I'm, I'm very concerned uh, uh, about this. And that gets to the issue of lowering uh, age standards, too. Um, so uh, thank you, and uh, I yield back. I think the uh, chair and would recognize myself for five minutes and to follow on to those questions uh, to counsel. What is the current limit to which uh, the ball in the photograph, uh, it must be manufactured? The ball, I think, would be a toy, and so it's subject to multiple limits. Uh, potentially, uh, it's difficult to tell sometimes from a picture 
whether it has a surface coating, but it could be subject to a surface coating standard, actually two or two different ones. It could, it's also subject, I believe, to a lead limit of uh, point z 0 0.03 percent. So what would be the, the uh, limit to which it must be manufactured under the draft? It would be the same. Thank you, and, and just want to reiterate uh, my desires to work with you, Ms. Schakowsky, uh, on the jewelry, if that's a concern as well. And with that, I yield back and my time. Will the chairman yield to me on that? Yes. When you say uh, uh, zero, what is it, zero? Zero point zero three percent. That, that comes to 300 parts per million. They are equivalent in uh, as long as you're measuring by weight, yes. Okay, thanks. Madam Chair, I'd like to be recognized by my own time. All right. I yield back my time and recognize Mr. Waxman for five minutes. I have a question about uh, this gardening kit. You can see uh, it's clearly intended for use by young kids. And under the current law, it has to meet a 300 parts per million lead standard and will have to meet a 100 parts per million standard in August. That's good because the law keeps children away from products that have dangerous lead contents. But as I read this draft, these protections are repealed. Under Section 3C3 of the Republican draft, there is an exception to the 100 and 300 parts per million total lead content limits for any metal component in a children's product intended primarily for outdoor recreational use. Now, Council, am I reading this draft correctly? This product is intended for uh, outdoor recreational use, so it would seem to be exempt from the one hearts, 100 parts per million and the 300 parts per million standard. Is that right? It depends upon whether or not you are correctly categorizing it as outdoor recreational use, but if that is true, then it would be subject to a higher limit for the metal components of it. Well, uh, just looking at the picture, I, I, it seems likely this would be used uh, a toy rake and shovel. It's more likely to be used outside than inside the house. But the key word have a sandbox in the house. The key word is toy, though. If if a toy is considered within the field of recreational products, there is some there is some uh, categorization there. Okay. Well, I the question is whether it's intended primarily for outdoor recreational use. And uh, products that are exempted from 100 parts per million and 300 parts per million standards can have very high levels of lead. Steel parts can contain up to 3,500 parts per million lead. Aluminum parts can contain up to 4,000 parts per million lead. Copper alloy parts can contain up to 40,000 parts per million lead. Pediatricians have told us that these are lead levels that are dangerous for children. I understand that the outdoor recreation exemption is in the bill to deal with products like ATVs, and I agree that we need to provide relief to ATVs, but the problem is that the way this draft is worded, the exemption is a lot broader than that. It is so broad, it covers products like this toy gardening set, which no one, I would hope, would want to have a high level content. I have another uh, uh, picture I want to hold up, and this is a, a teething ring. Uh, this is clearly a product intended for a baby. It's also a product that was recalled by the CPSC this past January because it posed an ingestion risk. Council, my understanding is that under the 2008 law, toys like these teething rings are supposed to be tested for potential hazards by third-party testers to determine whether they are truly safe for children. This testing requirement is not yet in effect, because the agency is in the process of promulgating, implementing regulations. But once these regulations are finalized, testing will be mandatory. Is that right? Under the current law, if the CPSC finalizes the regulations that a product that is a toy would be subject to mandatory third-party testing. Now, this bill before us repeals this requirement. It says that except for a few narrow categories like lead paint. There is no mandatory third-party testing. It gives the agency authority to require testing if the agency can jump through a, a series of hurdles, but it does not mandate these testing. 
uh, th this testing. Am I right about this? Does the bill eliminate mandatory third-party testing for products uh, like this teething ring, Council? It gives the Commission discretion whether or not to require third-party testing for products like that under certain circumstances. Okay. Well, discretion is different than a mandate. And I believe this is a serious problem with the draft. We have a current law that will give parents the security that dangerous products like a teething ring, if they are dangerous, will be tested for safety before they are marketed. But this draft takes us back to the time when the burden is on the agency uh, in order to recall, after, to uh, order a recall after children have already been hurt. And I point this out uh, uh, in order to illustrate a, a problem we have with this bill that we hope will be remedied by the time we get to full committee and we'd like to continue to work together to accomplish that goal. And the gentleman's time has Yield expired. Time. Thank you. And is there further discussion? Uh, Ms. For what purpose does the gentlelady seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, Council, I've, I've got two grandsons, a three-year-old and a two-year-old. Three-year-old uh, is or the Jack is turning three today. This is his birthday. Uh, they were out with me this weekend gardening. Uh, I've got an herb garden, and I love having them dig that. So I, I, I uh, have them outside with me. They dig in the dirt. We garden. We pick veggies. And so I'm interested that he would bring up a little case that looks like what I have for Jack and Chase and would have those toys in it. So, Council... Uh, since this is very similar to what my grandsons use, I'd like to ask you, where did the numbers come from that Mr. Waxman, the limits that Mr. Waxman referred to, where did you get those, where, where did those numbers come from? The numbers that are, um, that would be applicable to outdoor recreational products are, were established by, initially by the commission, but based on European uh, standards for metals. Okay. And then when did they adopt those limits? They've adopted them in several different contexts, but um, they were first adopted in uh, consumer product safety context in the, um, in the area of electronics products, products for children that are, are made out of electronics. And then they were also applied to ATVs, snowmobiles, motorbikes uh, in, in approximately May of uh, 2010, and then they were applied to bicycles thereafter. Okay. So they, those limits were adopted after Congress had passed? That is correct. They were, they were adopted, well, the, the electronics limits were adopted pursuant to congressional mandate on the electronics to establish uh, limits for that category products. And the ATV and bicycles uh, limits were set by the CPSC, actually without a particular authority, but uh, because of the inability of the, of the uh, products to meet the uh, standards. Okay, thank you, Council. Yield back. <coughs> yes, I'll yield to my colleague. standard, because this is more likely your grandchildren and my grandchildren playing with this outdoors. So the way the Republican bill treats it is that uh, there is an exception to the total lead content limits for these metal pro components in a children's product intended primarily for outdoor recreational use, primarily for outdoor recreational use. Were you thinking primarily of ATVs when you when that phrase was developed? I had a broader category in mind, uh, and I think uh, additional products are, are intended. Well, w were you intending a product like this to be excluded from the lead standard? Uh, I want to clarify that the products are not excluded. They are subject to a different limit, as you, I thought you understood that from your prior comment, that they have higher limits that are established for, for the metal parts. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, the, 
the category of outdoor recreational products is not uh, defined in the statute, but I do think it would include more than ATVs. I am not clear that it would include the product that you're demonstrating. Well, uh, from my understanding, you can have steel parts that can be very, very high in lead. Aluminum parts can be even higher. Copper alloy, 40,000 parts per million. Uh, and pediatricians are telling us th those levels could be pretty high. I don't know what these tools are made out of, but it seems to me that we ought to make sure that if they're tools with a very high level of lead, uh, that we shouldn't permit that. Re the, the reclaiming my time, time, if I may, I think what I'm hearing counsel say is uh, these are recreational products. The, there would not be an accelerated exposure by, it looks like a wooden handle, holding the wooden handle and then uh, using the little rake or the little shovel to help move the soil and till the soil. So I thank counsel for the comments and I yield back. Is there further discussion? Oh, without objection? The gentlelady is recognized for... I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to, uh, to, to clarify uh, a couple of things. Um, um, Madam Chairman, when you followed up on the, the question about the, the ball, counsel answered correctly that right now under the law, 300 parts per million are accepted. But is it not true that for under the, the current, under the law of the past, that um, that ball would have gone, had to go down to 100 parts per million in, in August? It depends upon if the commission determines it's technologically feasible, but apart from that, the answer is yes, it would go down to 100 parts per million. And is that also true for that um, outdoor recreational toy? The gardening set that Mr. Yes. Waxman is showing? If it, if it fit into that category, yeah, for children. It would it would be the same it would be the same standard yes it would go down to 100 provided that it's technologically feasible okay thank you very much I yield back thank the gentle lady is there further discussion all right if there are no further amendments and discussion the question occurs on favorably excuse me no all right okay. The question occurs on favorably reporting the bill to the full committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. Without objection, staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the bill approved by the subcommittee today. Hearing no objections, so ordered. The chair thanks all members and staff. The subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>